Good evening and welcome to Capital Connection, where we join the dots to give you the big picture for business in Africa. I am Fifi Peters. On the agenda, youth unemployment in Africa is at crisis levels and has been this way for a while. Africa is the world's youngest continent, but 60% of Africa's population are under 25 years old, while at the same time, the youth account for 60% of Africa's jobless. Our panel will discuss the reasons for the high levels of youth unemployment and what can be done to reverse an unsustainable situation. In Commodities Corner, the focus is on the avocado, and it's a fruit, not a vegetable. But first, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa is among more than 40 African leaders and 1,000 business executives in Beijing for the Africa-China Summit that kicked off today. Joining us for a view on the gathering is the Senior Researcher for China-Africa Relations at the South African Institute of International Affairs, Gwobis van Staden. Gwobis, thanks so much for your time. I imagine you'll be uh, looking at this uh, forum very closely. Uh, what are you expecting? We are expecting um, additional funding coming from China, um, breaking up into a bunch of different kinds of funding for African development. And that has come through. Um, and we're also looking at the expansion of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is this massive infrastructure development project that China is doing, which essentially will connect it with the parts of Asia, to Europe, as well as to Africa. So we're expecting that to be expanded to include more African countries. I mean, they're meeting under the theme, as I understand it, towards an even stronger community with a shared future through a win-win cooperation. How would you describe existing uh, relations between China and Africa? And, I mean, can we actually get to a situation where Africa, as well as China, actually benefit from this partnership? The, that, the phrase that you mentioned, um, you know, uh, is, is part of Chinese, the Chinese government's official description of its relationship with Africa, um, that they're all putting in the same direction, they're all, uh, you know, it's win-win development. That is true to a certain extent, although this is, the real situation is very complicated. Um, the, biggest, the biggest issue is that Africa has so much less power, especially economic power, than China. So there's always a, a, quite a bit of a power gap between the two. Um, however, China has also been quite responsive to what Africa wants, um, and it has been trying to, to push development in Africa, um, among others for, for the benefit of, the, of, of Chinese companies in the form of doing more business and expanding their capabilities. Um, however, to a large extent, getting the most out of this relationship is also up to African governments because as long as Africa, as, as much as African governments can proactively promote an agenda, China is then put in a position where they need to respond to that promotion. And I think that is very important. Mm. And of course, uh, this uh, summit is taking place so when we have got increased uh, talk and action of protectionism in the, the developed West. I mean, what do you think the leaders are going to say about the talks of trade wars and globalization versus protectionism? I think China and Africa are roughly on the same page in relation to, the, to these issues. They both are suffering from increased tariffs in the U.S. Um, of course, the U.S. is such a massive market, so it impacts everywhere. And they also are additionally penalized by the fact that, that other countries that are part of the global value chain have, see, have also been hit by tariffs. So there is a kind of a fallout of, of price increases across the board. Um, I think China and Africa, they, they see uh, meetings like this one as a way to show up community in a, in a moment where the West is withdrawing from the global community. Um, and the fact that Africa has committed itself to a massive continental free trade agreement is also also both of that. So it, it, it just more and more puts Africa and China roughly on the same page, both trying to pursue global trade more aggressively. Mm. Well, Gwibis, thanks so much for your insights. We'll leave it there. And now for a look at the avocado business with our Capital Connection correspondent, Anazi Zoti. 
Well, now they're saying green is the new gold because of avocado prices. Um, they're very high. Can you tell us what is causing this hike in the price? So avocado prices are high and will probably remain high in the near to medium term because of the growing local as well as global demand. We've seen everywhere on social media like uh, and marketing, like you see an Evo ad, you see an Evo DIY video, everywhere you look there's beauty products on Evos, how to wash your hair with avocado oil, how to make certain recipes using avocados, there's just this huge, you know, like a media campaign surrounding Evos. It's the new super fruit, it's the trendiest fruit out there, everyone is consuming more and more Evos globally, locally, and that growing, you know, like immense global consumer demand is just outpacing production and that's why prices keep on rising. So you say our production is relatively low uh, when it comes to making avocados. Why is the supply so low for avocado? So in 2017, we saw that production was low globally as well as locally. Mexico, the major producer, had drought, also impacting a lot of their production, so yield losses. And also Peru also had a lot of crop losses. South Africa were just recovering from the drought and production was low. But in contrary, actually in South Africa this year, we've seen that production has actually improved. So the industry is talking around six to eight million cartons extra that was added. So totally in this season, we've seen that we, we are estimating around 18 million cartons. And when you actually compare 2018 prices to 2017, prices have declined by around 20%. It's still roughly high because last year's prices were record prices and 2018 prices are still higher than the other previous years. So prices have declined, production is picking up. Like I said, production is just not keeping up with the demand. Okay, and what can we do to increase production uh, for avocados? Okay, so Peru and South Africa, we've just finished our season, so the Southern Hemisphere has finished their season. Uh, there's nothing much we can do, you know, it takes a while for production trees to actually yield fruit. So now the Northern Hemisphere will be starting their season, and in the interim there might be a shortage, so prices might actually increase in the interim. But we're just waiting for the Northern Hemisphere to also increase their supply, but over the long term, we expect that more produ production will happen in South Africa and will stabilize. We're expecting a whole year production and not this stop that you see between August until the season starts again because avocado industry is moving from an era where we had small scale farmers or small commercial farmers that are now becoming bigger commercial farmers. So as they are becoming more technologically advanced, they get their methods in place, we're expecting continuous production and that should help with the supply in the long term. Right, coming up after the break, a discussion on why African governments are not doing more to resolve the high and stubborn levels of youth unemployment. And here are some views from the streets of unemployed youngsters. It is really about changing our education system and getting corporates to create the right kind of jobs. Well, this is one issue that we've been dealing with constantly for years now. And as much as I would like to say that it's getting better, it also looks like it's getting worse. I think for me the solution is we need, we need more of Technicons, so we need that balance between theory and practical. So I think with Technicons, if we can push people to be like, to be like physically skilled or to be skilled to be able to make something. I think that's what I mean, to be able to make something. And the making of something obviously comes with a thought. So you put a thought into something and then you realize that something. So I think in so doing that, um, basically what you're doing then will be trying to eliminate poverty in a sense people can be able to employ themselves. Government is not doing what they're required to do. We're not saying that government should provide jobs you know, for the team in youth, but rather they should provide the enabling environment, okay, like uh, having the right infrastructure in place. I think the youth should just start up their own work, so self-employment, and then they can take it from there instead of having to wait for other people to employ them. Government need to do something concerning the youth unemployment because youth are the general, uh, youth are the uh, the face of tomorrow. Because if the government can be able to, you know find jobs and you know, create uh, employment for the youth. I think things can be very well for the youth in the country. Uh, government intervention in terms of funding small businesses and because small businesses are incubators for, for skill, 
And if we, if we empower small businesses, we're essentially empowering the youth. Welcome back to Capital Connection. Youth unemployment in Africa is often referred to as a ticking time bomb. The world's top 10 countries with the youngest average aged populations are all in Africa. The jury is still out on whether this is a curse or a blessing. Some argue that with effective governance, the youth can become the engine for the continent's growth. While on the flip side, others see the mixture of poor governance and youth jobless as a recipe for instability, crime and conflict. Joining us to discuss Africa's youth unemployment in Lagos is Mary Dina, the CEO of JobLink. And in Johannesburg, we are joined by Prince Mudau, the project manager at the Southern African Trust, and also Kenneth Diole, the head of research at Grind Africa. Uh, lady and gentlemen, welcome. So we're talking about youth unemployment now, and we know that it's sickingly high mm. on the continent. Prince, let me begin with you. Is the main reason reason why so many young people can't get a job because our economies, particularly that of South Africa, are just not growing fast enough. Yes, yeah, so the biggest problem at the moment is we, we have one of them, the most educated generations in Africa at the moment. So the issue really is not with the youth, it is with our economies. Are we, are we, are we providing jobs, are we providing job opportunities as economies? Uh, that is where the issue lies. Are we, are we manufacturing enough? Are we creating those uh, particular uh, environment, that particular environment that is needed for, 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 um, for maximum youth employment? Those are the questions that are, uh, 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 are really at the heart of youth unemployment in, 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 Af in Africa, South Africa in particular. Sure. Kenneth, for you, the economy or other factors at play here? I think there are multiple factors at play. I think one, when you look at the fact that, yes, we have an educated majority of young people, mm. better than before. However, there's obviously a skills mismatch. That means in terms of the, the market. But equally, when you look at the fact that the need report shows that one in every three young people under the age of 25, which is out of the 10.3 million young people between 15 and 25, 3.3 million of them fall in a category of need, neither employed, nor neither from, not in any form of education institution or training facilities. Mm. That also means that those who are not even un, uh, who are not unemployed also stand a chance of becoming form of the bubble which we call the chronic unemployment. So mm. within three to five years, they will become mm. unemployable. So I think there are multiple challenges. One, the market obviously not ready to absorb them. Mm. Two, there's also the question of skills. So for example, a lot of people who come out of high school without a, po a graduate at high education level training mm. are unemployable mm. because of the, ba the quality of our basic education. Mm. That makes it difficult for them to be hired at jobs that will generally require people with just a metric. So manual labor as well is changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, also we're moving towards a more industrialized economy the fourth industrial revolution as we sure. speak about it. That brings with itself multiple challenges. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you look at the fact that within the unemployment, uh, there's about 5.8 million young people who are unemployed, right? And if you look at the fact that manufacturing, construction, utilities, and mining, all of those sectors combined are almost the same amount of employees and yet young people themselves are equal to that. That sure. means there's a huge challenge and no matter how many jobs we create within these sectors, it will not be enough. Mm -hmm. And I think so the challenge for me, I think, is we have to have a conversation that is different. It's not just about job creation, because job creation could be if you, ha if you have an office, you can put a security guard, you can put somebody to put on the lights. That's job creation, sure. it's not value. But we should rather move to the conversation of creating value. Because once we create value, then we are opening a new industries and new markets and we bring in more people to play. But obviously, we requires an upskilling of the current skill set. Okay, but also let's, leave it there. let's leave yeah. it there for now because I actually want to probe you further on exactly no what you're saying. But Mary, bringing you into the conversation here, I mean, last year, uh, youth unemployment in Nigeria reached a record high. I do understand. I mean, for you, what are the challenges in getting young people into the formal economy? 
Yeah, so I mean, in Nigeria, for example, youth employment is over 33%. Um, and for, what I always say as well is that that is only half the story because those statistics represent predominantly the urban areas. When you start to look at other states um, further up in the north, some of the states in the south-south, you're looking at youth unemployment rates of close to 50%. Um, definitely the, a big challenge there is education. The educational level uh, needs to be stronger, it needs to be better. Also, for me, my company, what we do, JobLink Foundation, is we help youths improve their empl employability. We also help them improve their CVs. So skills development, skills-based de development, having a stronger national career service is also very important so that we can connect the graduates and the, the youths that we have to work. Um, also, Nigeria, for example, has focused in many years um, on oil and gas sector. There's a strong need for diversification mm -hmm. and the unemployment situation in Nigeria has that as an issue in the heart of it. Because when you look at uh, the number of uh, the, the labor force in Nigeria, you're looking at about 85 million people. The number of people that the oil and gas sector employs is only a fraction of that. Mm -hmm. So you then have millions and millions of people all trying to apply for you know, just um, a handful of jobs and that cannot continue. Mm -hmm. We need to improve and grow the economy in the areas of agriculture, in the areas of hospitality, areas of manufacturing, IT, so that we're able to create more jobs and you know, be able to place these graduates into those jobs. Right, so diversification of the economy, uh, one a strong solution to uh, really reducing the jobless uh, rate of young people on the uh, African continent. So now the president, uh, President Ramaphosa of South Africa has created the, the Yes campaign, right? Yeah, and you know, encouraging companies to take on more youth, create more job opportunities, giving them tax incentives and, and, and the like. I mean, Prince, for you, do you think that this will be enough to bring down that uh, unemployment rate here in South Africa, which at 60%, I do understand, yes, is one of the yes. highest in the world? Yes. So the, the issue mostly with every job that that with every job advert a proper job advert they need experience mm. and it's always two three years experience that is needed mm. so if really um, companies are aged and encouraged by the government uh, companies have as well a responsibility in terms of developing youth whereby they take youth as interns and then they give them jobs so that they can have the required necessary experience mm -hmm. so that they can be able to uh, get into the formal job uh, sector as well. Mm -hmm. So that is key. So the issue really is not about what has been put up. The issue is about implementation. That sure. is where we should zero in to say, well, we have the years campaign. We have it in place. We have it in the policies. We, we, we have so many policies as well in South Africa that has to do with uh, 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 skills development for the youth. But the issue is now in implementation, getting it onto the streets, getting it into Soweto, getting it into Cosmos City. That is where the key is, whereby we say, okay, we have this wonderful campaign that we have started. We have this, um, we, we have this policy that we have. Then how do we take it uh, to the people? How do we make it have an impact in the youth? Really, it's, it's a great campaign and I was reading and I saw that as well, it has started, it, it has started as well to, sure. to, to have some young people being employed by different companies. It's a great initiative, but I think it has to continue as it is being a great initiative and like most policies that we have in Africa whereby we just have it in policy, but they... But, but, but we they, don't they, implement. We I don't mean, implement. Because I mean, it can't always um, or all be about uh, young people looking for jobs mm. because we do know there's an entrepreneurial spirit amongst a lot of us. Mm. and. And also, we also know that it's the small businesses that yeah. are going to be the, the drivers of economic growth. Yeah. So going back to the skills in education, yeah. I mean, should we, you know, be teaching entrepreneurship as a subject, perhaps, mm -hmm. so that more young people, when, once they graduate, they say, okay, no, let me mm -hmm. start my business and go and possibly employ more other young people? 
I mean, the question of teaching entrepreneurship is can one really teach entrepreneurship? Mm. I think one, there are skill set that might lead one to be an entrepreneur, but I don't think we can actually teach entrepreneurship. Um, I think so, so. I think that's important. I think one, we need to also be focusing from an education perspective to what can potentially be. So, so I think what's important for a country like South Africa and many countries that face high unemployment is for the government, but also private sector to say what kind of a state particular or an economy we want to be. Do we want to be a services industry? Do we want to be a manufacturing? Or do, what do we want to be? Because that will guide, one, the policy, but two, also the skills of where young people should be actually trying to get in. Because what you see, for example, in a lot of Asian countries, they chose particular space. They said, one, okay, we're going to do innovation specifically within, which is, which is going to be covered with um, innovation in the sense of, let's say, the, the automotive sector. Like if you go to Korea or South Korea specifically, there's part, there's manual labor for that, but there's also innovations around the cars that they produce. So a lot of the time targeted funding will, will, will go to that particular space in terms of educating young people. So I think from a South Africa perspective, we don't know what kind of an economy we're trying to be because we still heavily, we have a lot of natural resources that we actually not have used to the best of our ability, but we have a thriving fi uh, fi uh, private sector, especially within the financial services sector. That's important. But I think broadly, we don't know what we want to do. And I think that's a conversation that we need to have because that will guide many young people to say, if I am studying this, it's almost a guaranteed. Because today we even have master's graduate in actual science who are unemployed. Sure. That's the skill skill. And obviously that tells you that there's a problem, one, from a mismanagement or mismatch of skills, but two, from available jobs. Because even touching on the year's campaign, for example, it's one million jobs over three years. We have, you know, I mean, when you look at the, the last definition, we had unemployment of 27.2%, mm -hmm. which is about six, 6 million people. Broad definition is in, I think, 36.7, which is about 8.8 uh, I mean, 8 .8 million people. That's including not just young people. And obviously the question, is, it, it, I mean, the rate of absorption compared to the rate of output in terms of young people from universities, from TVET colleges, or just from school, it's, it's, I mean, the, the ratio does not match. So we have to look at also, I mean, entrepreneurship is a key vehicle to that, but also so how do we incentivize? Because I, I think there's a difference between just bringing in young people into companies, but also incentivizing companies to actually fund young people who want to start out um, or start up entrepreneurial ventures. And I think All that's right. important. All right. And Mary, I mean, uh, your view on entrepreneurship as a potentially being a, a key a savior for many young people who don't have jobs. Yeah, I mean, I agree that um, the economic growth if you look at all the top economies of the world, it has always been driven by growth in small to medium sized uh, enterprises. I, I do think that you can definitely study entrepreneurship. I have a postgraduate uh, degree from Harvard University in entrepreneurship. Um, and I got that at the age of 24, immediately after I set up a hospitality consulting firm, which I've now run for about 10 years. Um, I think that the key skills and the knowledge to start up new ventures and to have the confidence and the, the, uh, the know-how to put together a company that is going to be sustainable is key. So entrepreneurship should be taught in schools. And I'm sure at the moment, within business schools across the world, they do teach entrepreneurship. However, another mo much more important thing is the, the availability of funds. A lot of people that even know how to build companies, know how to set up companies, don't have the knowledge, um, the basic knowledge to be able to go into the banks and go into um, lenders, go to lenders and set up those meetings to raise those funds. And that's what we have to make more accessible. The average person, the average graduate should be able to know exactly what they need to do to acquire funds, to build their company, to build their corporation. That startup funding is absolutely necessary and key. That's what we need to start to put in place, certainly in, in Nigeria and then also across Africa as well. Sure. Prince? Yes, with me. To add, much was talking about with regards to the issue of funds. There are even other social hindrances that are there with regards to entrepreneurship among uh, young people in South Africa they call it black tax mm -hmm. so you find mm -hmm. so most most young people they go out there they get the little fund that they get to start a, a company to start a small enterprise mm -hmm. and then they get caught up in in in, in, in family issues in, in supporting families in uh, in, in, in raising our families and stuff like that, to find that the enterprises do not grow. Mm. They, they, they go back again to square one, they close down, they go back to work. With regards to the issue of funding as well, what, what Mary was talking about, most young people don't have the gravitas to get funding from banks. Sure. So I think if we start there by saying, can we find policies that allow these young people to get funding? Can 
can can can, can we increase the 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 the, 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 the space in terms of funding and inv investors as sure. well. Now, now we're talking about uh, 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 the fourth industrial revolution, but we find that most, um, most investors are very skeptical about funding uh, uh, such enterprises, you know, especially from young people. So that is where we should start to say, can the youth be given an opportunity in terms of funding? And then sure. they, create, they, they create their own jobs, they create jobs for the other young people as well. Sure. Guys, uh, thanks so much for your time. We have, however, run out of time on this very important uh, conversation. But nonetheless, uh, once again, I'd like to thank my guests for today. And uh, yeah, brings us to the end of the show. Uh, join us again on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central African time for more insights and views. Good night.